Welcome to America's Heroes Group. And welcome back to America's Heroes Group. This time with our round tape on our partner, National Women's Veterans United, NWVU. December is AIDS Awareness and National Human Rights Month. Today is Saturday, December 10th, 2022. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm Sean Claiborne, the co-host, Army National Guard veteran. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a familiar voice. You've heard her many times on our show, and also as a panelist and a roundtable panelist years ago when we first started America's Heroes Group. Miss Rochelle Crump, she's a U.S. Army veteran, founder, and president of National Women's Veterans United. And we're going to talk about something that I know she has a lot to say about, and that is the lack of funding support that's needed for women veterans organizations. Um, what is going on, uh, Rochelle? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. And you, how are you, Sean? Doing good, doing good. Okay, can you hear me okay? I hear you perfect, loud and clear. Oh, wonderful. So tell us what's going on. So so tell us about the discrepancy or the, the, the inconsistency, perhaps, with funding for women's veteran service organizations. Um, what is the process well, like, and who are, who are the people that donate to you, first of all? Well, the people who donate to us are mostly like our members, uh, our families, and uh, mostly outside entities when we've had grants other than like grants with the health initiative in which we got a lot of grants, small grants, but nonetheless they came when needed. And that was from Pfizer, uh, you know, for health benefits and uh, awareness for women veterans. And the majority of our grants that we've had have been outside of Illinois. You know, when we first um, moved, we got a good grant from an uh, outside entity from Birmingham, Alabama. And we got another grant uh, from California. Um, and, and, you know, those were our largest grants. And other than that, we picked up small grants like from NICOR, um, and pretty much that's kind of been it other than our, our, you know, the fundraisers that we do and things like that. We applied at the McCormick Foundation before, and it seemed like we couldn't ever get involved with them. You know, I don't know. Sometimes I used to think it was personality, but, you know, um you know, you, you have to look the other way and, and you just keep moving in the direction in which you can try to other, you know, entities to get grants. So when the Cook County came out with the grant, you know, we just knew that we would, you know, um, be a part of that. It was a struggle. Number one is because we had a major event going on at the same time. You had less than 30 days to put the grant together. Um, some of the things that they wanted, for example, you had to have like what they call the um, entity ID number. Well, that replaced pretty much your DUNS number because they're no longer using the DUNS number. And that's critical, used to be critical for you to get grants outside of, uh, you know, just regular grants because it has a lot to do with government procurement and things like that. And so just learning that process, trying to learn it at the last minute, uh, I was able to secure it. I was not able to at the last minute. I mean, I went all the way down to the wire with, with that grant. I had good notes from there. I uh, participated in the webinar, you know, and there was about 200 and something people on that line, you know. Wow. And uh, I really didn't like the way that they um, just, I guess the announcement that came out of who the recipients of the grants were, which came out November the 10th, but my expectation was that they should have, in my opinion, that's my opinion, that if you had 200 and something people who were interested in the grant and you had all of those emails, it would have been nice if they had received that information, you know, via email. Uh, since they had the power to do that pretty much. I think that would have been really good because I kept looking around for it and I finally found it on November the 10th. And I looked up the list and I went down the list and I just, you know, kind of said, okay, okay. Only thing about it is they don't tell you what they do, mm -hmm. what they, what the funding is for. It doesn't give you like any clue of that unless you are familiar with the agency yourself. 
some of them I am familiar with. Others, I kind of looked them up briefly just to see, you know, what they do. Some of them are newcomers. They didn't necessarily work uh, in the aspect for veterans, but in the community, and most of them are community-based. I looked at some of their boards and things like that to see if they had uh, veterans on their board uh, or in their leadership. I, I looked to see if they had an agenda for veterans on some of the websites. You know, some did and some didn't. And these are the recipients um, of the grant, the Cook County grant you're talking yes, about. Yes, okay. the recipients of the grant. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there was a $100,000, $100,000 award, and I think there were about 10 of them. Okay. Yeah, 10 of those, and then they had 50,000, about eight or nine of them, you is, know. Is, that, and is so there a then set number they're, that, they have, that they're going for with these grants? Or are they looking for, at least for this Cook County they are. They were awarded the grant. But were they, are they, and, is there like uh, a set amount of organizations that are, are going to get it? There are like 10 slots, or is it just anybody who qualifies gets these grants? No, there were different grants that they had to apply for. Mm hmm and um, you either went for the 100000 or you went for the 50000 and that's all really that they did. We thought they were going to do $10,000 grants and stuff like that, but it's my understanding now that there is $80,000, I guess, sitting at, in that coffin for honor grants, and that's to be announced in spring of 2023. Uh, I guess they're going to open it up again is what I'm thinking. Uh an additional 80000 in honor grants funding will be announced in spring of 2023. So um, I'm in the uh, thought that they will have probably 10,000 grants, which would, you know, pretty much bring in like eight more, <laughs> uh, eight more organizations. And, um, you know, I guess we'll apply for that. Now, what I looked at is some of the ones that got the $100,000, one of them was Safe Haven. Uh, they get a lot of grants. Let's just, I mean, if you know anything about Safe Haven, they know how to write good grants, I guess. They got a shoe in everywhere you go because they got a lot of money. They operate um, homeless for homeless, not just for veterans, but also for those who are incarcerated, who uh, can't go to any communities because of sexual or, you know, um, predator uh, issues on their names and they can't go into the community and, you know, different places. It's hard to place them, you know, when they get out of prison and everything. So they got a lot of them. There's no separatism for veterans that are homeless and go to safe haven. And that's one of the issues that I have. In fact, that's the <coughs> most important issue that I have. Because I don't believe that veterans who have served this country honorably should have to go into a shelter and do and be a part of a regime pretty much that treats those uh, homeless men and women just like they're still in prison. You know, I've seen them marching for marching in for lunch. So you, feel you know, that, just you feel like the safe haven you, treats uh, homeless people like they're prisoners. Yes. Okay. Yes. And for the women, the women had complaints that were in Safe Haven uh, at a time when we were helping some of them because they were moving. They got the voucher. They were able to move out and everything, and they still needed assistance, and we assisted them. And that was some of their biggest complaints was that they had to share a room uh, with people who had been incarcerated and also – they had to share that room with even their child in there. Some of them could not bring their male children as in all of the shelters. That's a rule. You know, after a certain age, the child, if it's a male, cannot be on the female side. All right, they treat that. Well, well you know, no one like is going to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of shelters are like that where you can't, if you're like over 16 but, I think, or something like that, yeah, you can't have them. But, the you know. Room. They treat them like men, but, basically. But then you put the kid with no a woman. man. <laughs> With grown men, and that could be another issue, another problem. Absolutely. But no woman is going to leave their child, even if they were a teenager, mm -hmm. 14, 15, 12 years old, because I think that's the limit. You know, and some of them have even cheated if they were small, you know, and may have had age, but they didn't tell them that. 
Um, they tried to make sure that they were able to stay with them. You know, I would not leave my son, take my son <laughs> over to the other side with grown men that I know nothing about. And these people have been in prison and all that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. So, you know, some of them just don't even go there. But nonetheless, my point there is that, you know, I asked them if they would start a wing for women veterans so that they could be separated and have their own little wing where they would feel a lot better with, you know, being down and out at that time after, you know, being in such resiliency in the military and other things they may have done and then found themselves in a situation where they were homeless. So, and that was not a place that they could thrive, not a place where they could actually grow and help themselves because a lot of them started giving up, you know what I'm saying? And it became a a lot for them, especially with mental health issues already. So, and that never existed for the wing. You know, they said that they would look at it. Of course, they never did. So now we get to the one for Benjamin Davis, BFW Post 311. Now, I'm very troubled by that, and I'm troubled because the past commander of that uh, organization, he is the the last past commander, worked for the same office where this grant is derived from. That is a conflict of interest in many ways. Although he is not the commander any longer, he was uh, often, he worked as an employee. And employees have a obligation to comply with a um, revolving door policy, which is set by ethics. And I believe that this is a failed uh, overlook, maybe. We'll say it's a hope that they overlooked it. And maybe they don't understand that it looks like, you know, just what they were trying to present it from looking like. And that was for... Um, and it was an effort with ethics to see, to make sure that it would not look like someone was using their connections with the county because they worked as an employee or was an officer or something like this. Well, that's exactly what it looks like. So, you so know? if someone works for the county, they can't apply for the grants? Yes, okay. because... The people who were actually operating the grant are the ones that they worked with. Okay. And it's no dispute about that. There's a one-year revolving door policy. I know with the state of Illinois, when I retired from the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago, that resolving door was effective for the state of Illinois for sure. I could never get a grant from my organization for the um, from the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. You know, it was a clear conflict because I was the assistant director there before. But even after so many years, how long do you keep somebody from, you know, being executed for that uh, policy? You know, and each time... I actually, you know, found that it was, to me, it was a, oh, no, uh, because you worked here before. You know, you know the people and all this stuff. And I'm like, that policy is only a year old. I've been away from there almost 10 years, Mm -hmm. you know. But nonetheless, you know, you look at that, this is really fresh. He has not been retired yet a year, I don't think. Wow. And so, you know, I I think that we're going to have to, raise some questions about it. Um, not that, you know, I'm, you know, mad that they got it or anything like that. I'm happy that they got it, you know, and I hope that they'll use it appropriately to help veterans in the Cook County area. But do we know for I sure that, that you, mentioned, you mentioned the state of Illinois has a has a rule where if you, you have a one-year revolving door policy, do you know if Cook County has that yes. same pop, the same rule? or is that? Yes, they do. Okay. Actually, I looked it up. And it was effective March the 31st, mm-hmm. post-employment restrictions and associated waivers. Now, maybe he got a waiver. I don't know how he could get a waiver because he's not even over a year. And you can't say that that person would not be an influence when you worked with that person. There's no way possible that you can even justify it. Mm-hmm. 
Well, one of the things okay. you brought up too is is that a lot of the people that are recipients tend to be the same organizations. How how much turnaround or how uh, frequently do you see new organizations on as recipients of these grants? Well, you know, Cook County, this is like the first time that I've ever seen them have money to do this type of of grant. The people who are getting these grants are recipients from other entities that always manage to get the grants because, number one, is they might have the staff to do so. And that was some of the complaints that was on the initial um, webinar where they were asking questions and getting answers and the uh, administrators of the grants and those people who were going to be looking at the grants basically indicated that, you know, oh, we'll look at that, you know, um, you have to, but you, you, it's up to you to be able to figure out how to get that grant complete. It's not up to them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So much of that was you having this grant for veterans, but you also heard the cry out for the issues that are blocking veterans from being able to get the grant, you know, because they don't have the staff, they don't have the people who know how to write the grants and things like that. They didn't have the funds to hire, you know, a grant writer. So they were saying, well, we'll look at it another time and blah, blah, you know, and that's just how we, oh, blah, blah, you know. And, and so, but, you know, you're looking at this, like set up this is another one. They get a lot of grants, a lot of money. They get money from the federal government, from the VA. They do a good job, of course. And I'm not going to say that because I used to work with them. I'm not saying just because I worked with them before. I'm saying that because I know the work that they have done. I have witnessed the work that they've done. Mm -hmm. Now, what I have not witnessed is the uh, VFW, any work that they've done other than having, you know, members to come together. They have a, a large membership, you know. They, they did a resource fair. Mm -hmm. You know, they do a lot of other things and stuff, but it appears that, you know, they're doing it for the population of the people that are their memberships who would benefit for it, and rightfully so, because they are veterans too. Rightfully so. So it's like they already have a hand of people who they can assist, you know, right there, a pool right there. As far as doing something on the outside, I mean, maybe they didn't have the funds to do it. I don't know. Well, it sounds, you know? Like, it sounds like to me, like when, when we look at, not, not just with veteran service organizations, but pretty much with charities in general, 501c3s in general, a lot of the bigger mm -hmm. grants tend to go to the bigger organizations. Just because, like you mentioned, yeah. they have all the resources and things like that. Do you feel yeah. that there is, are there any incubator type programs? Because there are some, like in the small business world, for example, there are programs and grants that you can get as a small business that a large organization may not be able to, won't be able to qualify to apply for because they're too big. Like an organ, mm -hmm. should maybe Cook County or maybe the state of Illinois or different, um, um, or, or different uh, jurisdictions create particular grants just for small uh, uh, VSOs? You know, maybe ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, or so on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and yeah. I think that's, I believe that's what their attempt would be with the eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You know, I believe that's what it is. However, when you look at the ones who already got the the large grants, they already have like Volunteers of America. You know, that's another one. You look at, like I said, there's some other ones too that are new to their newcomers. You know. And you look at, you know, the legal services and things like that, looking at what they do and what they don't do. Some of the things that they do that got me is that they do legal things, but they don't do the things, the legal things that most of them need the legal problems for. That's parking tickets, traffic tickets, criminal, you know, personal injuries. Those are the things that they need, and those are the things they don't do. So, you know, when you look at the base of, you know, well, how do you plan on, you know, helping them with the funds that you get if you don't do all those things that they really need you to do? So, you know, and the same thing with the housing, the housing piece. You know, we, we want to see more housing come up. Well, Safe Haven there in Indiana now, they got housing going on now, big houses too, uh, projects for homeless veterans in Indiana because they have the opportunity to get into all those and they are well connected. 
Inner Voice is another one. They got money. They could use money. They house veterans, you know. Um, they've got a good board that works on behalf of veterans, and they are great, you know, in terms of what they do. Uh, they do service projects themselves, even being homeless and in the homeless thing. Uh, I used to be on that board before, too, and, and I'm just saying this because I've witnessed the work that they do. So you give credit where credit is due. And so those veterans help veterans move. They've done things like that, you know, at the drop of a hat. You know, you call them, and they'll do stuff like that. Hmm. So you got another one. Hmm? No, no, no. Just, I was saying. So, but let me ask you this one question. We have about a minute left, so still kind of, you know, kind of mm-hmm. captured everything. So, when you look at the whole list of the recipients, do you think, as a whole, they actually these groups and organizations are actually doing things, substantial things, not just um, things for show, but substantial things to improve the veteran community, at least in the footprint that they're supposed to cover? I can't say that because if you go to their websites and look, a lot of them were not really doing veteran projects. Hmm. So these are newcomers. Those Some of them are newcomers to the veteran community, and maybe they have dealt with some veterans before that wasn't an agenda for them, though. Wow. And that's what we have to look at, you know. So And then how are people going to know that these people got this money that they can now go to and ask them for help if they don't know what help they can ask for? That's famous so, last words. That's we got the a, biggest problem. Right, we're out of time. So, Rochelle, thanks for coming out and telling us about this. So, let us go and look at this and let's raise questions and also reach out to these organizations and let them know what is happening. U.S. Army Veteran exactly. Founder of President of National Women's Veterans United. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back.